Good afternoon. Welcome again. You are joining in the remote public scoping meeting for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation uh, proposal. We will be getting started in just a few minutes at about 2 p.m. Thank you everyone for your time this afternoon. We'll speak in just a few moments. Good afternoon and welcome. You're tuning in to the remote public scoping meeting for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation proposal. The City Environmental Quality Review or seeker number for the application is 23DCP076K. My name is Stephanie Shalou and I'm the director of the New York City Department of City Planning's Environmental Assessment and Review Division or EARD. Evren Olker Kajar, Deputy Director of EARD, will co-host today's meeting, and in the event of any technical challenges on my end, Evren will take over hosting this meeting on my behalf. We truly appreciate your patience with this remote meeting format and its challenges. I do want to thank everyone again for taking time out of your day to attend this virtual meeting and acknowledge that technology isn't perfect, but it's an invaluable tool that allows these critical land use and environmental review processes to proceed. I also want to emphasize that today we'll hear from everyone who wishes to speak, and the meeting will remain open until we've heard from all of our registered speakers. We also welcome written comments and testimony that will be accepted through 5 p.m. Monday, February 27th, 2023, and we provide written comments with the same attention and consideration as comments that we'll hear today live at this meeting. All right, we will now proceed to the public scoping meeting for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation proposal. For the record, again, I'll note that the City Environmental Quality Review or seeker application number is 23DCP076K. Today's date is February 16th, 2023, and the time is approximately 2.02 p.m. Next slide. Again, my name is Stephanie Shalou, and I'm the Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division at the New York City Department of City Planning. I will be chairing today's meeting. The Department of City Planning is acting on behalf of the City Planning Commission as the lead agency for the proposal's environmental review. As lead agency, the department will be responsible for overseeing the preparation and completion of the proposal's Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. Next slide. Joining me today are several colleagues of mine from the Department of City Planning. Um, as mentioned, Evren Olker Kajar, Deputy Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division, Alex Summer, Director of the Department's Brooklyn Office, Louise Cafiero is the Environmental Assessment and Review Division Project Manager for the project, and Jesse Hirokawa is the Project Manager for the proposal in the Department's Brooklyn Office. I will also mention that during today's meeting, there are many staff of DCP working in the background to ensure that this meeting runs smoothly. Thanks as always to them. Next slide. Together, we're here to receive your comments on the draft scope of work for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation proposal. The draft scope of work identifies the subjects that will be analyzed in the upcoming draft environmental impact statement or DEIS, and describes the methodologies that will be used in those analyses. The draft scope of work materials are available online on the Department of City Planning's website. Next slide. Again, the purpose of today's public scoping meeting is to allow for public participation in the preparation of the DEIS at the earliest stage possible in the environmental review process. Specifically, scoping allows the public to help shape the DEIS before it is written. Towards that end, the department as lead agency will receive verbal testimony on the draft scope of work today from elected officials, government agencies, and representatives of the local community board, as well as members of the general public. We also welcome written comments on the draft scope of work. Written comments can be submitted through, as I mentioned, Monday, February 27th of this year, 2023 at 5 p.m. Next slide. At the end of the written comment period, the department as lead agency will review all comments, those we hear today, as well as any written comments that we receive. We will carefully review all comments and the department will decide what changes, if any, need to be made to the draft scope of work, and we will issue a final scope of work. It's the final scope of work that serves as the basis for the draft environmental impact statement. Next slide. 
Today marks the beginning of the written comment period on the draft scope of work. No decisions will be made today regarding the draft scope of work. Again, the purpose of the meeting is to allow the public to provide their comments on the draft scope of work and to allow the department to listen to those comments. It's important that all voices are heard today. Next slide. I'll now focus on the structure of today's meeting, which is divided into three parts. Uh, first, the applicant team will make a brief presentation describing the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation proposal. The applicant team will provide a brief summary of the environmental review's draft scope of work. In total, this should take about 20 minutes or so. During the second part of the meeting, the department will hear testimony from elected officials, representatives of government agencies, and those speaking on behalf of the local community board. And during the third and final part of the meeting, we will receive testimony from members of the general public. Next slide. On to a few logistics of today's scoping meeting. If you wish to speak and plan to access the, this meeting online, please remember to register through the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation public scoping meeting page of the NYC Engage portal at www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage. A link to join us and provide your testimony will be emailed to you after you have completed the registration process on the NYC Engage portal, and we'll add you to our speakers list. Next slide. When it's your turn to speak, your name will be called and you will be promoted to panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera if you wish. There will be a short period that appears you are no longer in the meeting. Don't be alarmed as you will automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. You'll then be asked to convey your remarks. To allow us to hear from everyone, we ask that you limit your remarks to three minutes. A three minute countdown clock will run on the screen if you're participating online. At the three minute mark, your time will expire. You'll be asked to conclude your remarks at that time. Next slide. An additional note of instruction for those of you joining us by phone today. If you wish to provide testimony via telephone, I'll prompt you at various points in the meeting to select star nine. Please listen for me to call out the last three digits of your phone number. At that point, you'll be given the te temporary ability to share your testimony. You'll need to press star six to unmute your telephone and we'll be able to hear you. And when your testimony is complete or your three minutes have expired, whichever comes first, you'll need to press star six again to mute yourself. We would encourage all participants who wish to provide testimony to register via phone using the dial-in participant hotline that was displayed on the screen at the beginning of this meeting. Please note that muting and unmuting speakers takes a moment, so we do appreciate your patience. On to time limits, speakers from the general public have three minutes to give testimony. There are a few exceptions to the three minute limit. Elected officials, for example, are given the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. To those of you viewing us on the live stream, if you wish to testify, please be mindful of background noise during your testimony. Make sure that the live stream is muted when you begin to avoid hearing an echo. If anyone is viewing today's presentation but does not wish to provide testimony, you are able to stream the meeting using the live stream links um, that are posted on NYC Engage and on our website. If you wish to submit written testimony, it can be submitted to the Department of City Planning. Our mailing address is shown here, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Attention, myself, Stephanie Shalou. You can also email us comments at the email address shown on the screen, 23dcp 076 k underscore dl at planning.nyc.gov. This information is all available on the NYC Engage portal and on the DCP website, nyc.gov slash planning. We will accept comments, as I mentioned, through Monday, February 27th, 2023 at 5 p.m. If you missed any of the instructions, feel free to visit nyc.gov slash nyc engage for instructions on how to participate and provide testimony. 
we will now move on to the first part of the meeting and I'll introduce Blondell Pinnock uh, to prevent, provide an overview of the proposed project to be followed by the environmental consultant and other members of the applicant team who will summarize the remainder of the proposal. Blondell, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon and thank you to the Planning Commission for having us here today. My name is Blondell Pinnock, and I'm the president and CEO of Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. I'm joined today by a number of people on our broader project team, who you will get the chance to hear from momentarily as we work our way through this agenda. I'm delighted to be here to present to you the vision for the Restoration Innovation Campus, a culmination of years of planning and community engagement to help advance our organization's mission of closing the racial wealth gap. As you know, Restoration was established as the nation's first community economic development corporation in 1967. For 55 years, Restoration has been a trusted leader in the community, attracting much needed employers and services to our campus while promoting economic growth and providing essential programs for local residents. Indeed, Central Brooklyn is booming, but, Longtime residents and people of color have largely been left out of this success. Next slide. The racial wealth gap in our community today shows the staggering results of decades of inequities where median net worth for Blacks in the U.S. is approximately $24,000 versus $188,000 for white households. Next slide. In Brooklyn alone, the wealth gap is between 40 to 50 billion and is widening after a pandemic that was particularly devastating to black and brown neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy. Next slide. Now we need to ensure longtime central Brooklyn residents benefit from the economic success of the neighborhood. And we have an opportunity to harness the growth of Brooklyn's innovation economy to support wealth creation for longtime residents. And there is no better place to begin disrupting the racial wealth gap. Central Brooklyn is at the cross section of many key assets needed for growth, a large and diverse workforce, arts and culture vibrancy, and proximity to the city's other major innovation hubs. Next slide. In order to scale Restoration's impact to meet this moment, we turn to one of our greatest assets, the community, to help us reimagine what Restoration Plaza should be. Through a series of visioning sessions in 2019, led by architect David Ajay, designer of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, four top priorities for the future of the campus emerge. One, increasing the visibility of the arts program, two, expanding job and educational opportunities, three, improving open space, and four, bringing in retail. With my arrival at Restoration over the summer, I commenced another set of listening tours this past fall and look forward to gathering additional input from the community in the coming months as we work to further develop this plan. Next slide, please. The ambitious vision is no less than a full-scale reimagining of the plaza as the Restoration Innovation Campus, a destination in the heart of central Brooklyn where mission-aligned partners will work together towards closing the racial wealth gap. The heart of the site will be dedicated to a major expansion of the Billie Holiday Theater, and the campus will include two new office buildings dedicated to attracting new employers, to our community and scaling economic mobility programs with private, public, and nonprofit partners. Next slide, please. The vision intentionally focuses and renews Restoration's position as a catalyst for economic development in the neighborhood, a beloved town square for one of the country's largest African-American communities. While our organization will continue its work through Brooklyn to expand affordable housing and home ownership opportunities for all, we have at the direction of the community and our board intentionally crafted the plan for the innovation campus to expand restoration's capacity 
to attract employers and invest to our community and provide direct financial inclusion services for people of color. We see offsite housing development and expansion of our economic mobility programs. We are scaling with this project as complementary measures, fundamental for disrupting the wealth gap. Next slide. In short, this project will significantly expand the scope of resources restoration is able to offer to the community, foster the creation of black wealth right here in central Brooklyn and become a model for equitable economic development that can be replicated across the nation. For more details on the campus design, I'm going to turn it over now to Jacob Dugaplowski, one of our architects from WXY, which is helping us to navigate the Euler process and translate this grand campus vision into reality. Thank you. Thank you, Fonda. Next slide. So my name is Jacob Dugopolsky. I'm associate principal with WXY Architecture and Urban Design, and I'll walk through the urban design architectural approach. Um, the project location is a full block in Bedford Stuyvesant with primary frontage on Fulton Street to the north, secondary and Herkimer Street to the south, and between New York and Brooklyn Avenue. Next slide. The existing plan is a collection of buildings and adaptations over time. Campus with retail spaces along Fulton Street, from restaurants to banks and a grocery store at the corner of Fulton and Brooklyn Avenue. The, the Sheffield building in the center holds the Billy Holiday Theater, surrounded by Restoration Plaza. Next slide. The proposed plan is to rezone from C45D currently to C62 allowing for additional use groups, such as innovation uses in use group 11, and expanding the floor area from 4.2 FAR to 6.0 FAR, or 840,000 zoning square feet. And the illustrative building's uh, square footage breakdowns included below spanning from retail to cultural, but as Blandell mentioned, an, a strong emphasis on new office space. Next slide. The existing plaza as an adaptation over time accommodates a wide variety of programs, but is compromised in what it can hold. It's not visible from the street. It's not universally accessible and it has limited event capacities as it's broken up through three different pieces. Next slide. One of the main features that in the proposal is the proposed plaza providing at grade open spaces along Fulton Street for a universally and broadly accessible community space for everyday and event flexibility. And there's two mid-block connectors east and west of the cultural building and the, the, the new Billy Holiday Theater in the, in the center um, that will connect the block and provide this, this uh, fully rounded uh, public realm. Next slide. This is supported through landscaping with the double row of trees and large planters along Fulton Street flexible seating and stage in the central plaza, the shade trees and small kiosks activating the west connector and the east connector toward Brooklyn Ave is a more passive space with a variety of seating and planting, connecting to a new garden uh, and space along the south along Herkimer Street. So next slide. So here's a view of the illustrative buildings looking southwest with Fulton Street in the foreground. The proposed project includes two floors of retail space in both the Brooklyn and New York buildings on both sides, and one floor of uh, innovation use group 11 uses and the office space above that. <clears throat> the component of education space mixed in as part of the New York Avenue and Fulton Street frontage. The cultural building in the center consists of cultural space on the ground and second floors, education space, and office space on the fourth floor as the, the centerpiece to the complex. Next slide. Looking from the opposite corner toward the southeast is the luster massing shows multiple setbacks on both buildings to shape the building and accommodate the range of, of office tenants envisioned. And I have a few views at, at grade level uh, to walk through the proposal as well. Next slide. The first is looking from Fulton Street to the south, showing the open engaging base of each building and supporting this, this new plaza and hub. 
Next slide, a couple of views of the plaza. Second is looking west along Fulton Street, showing the full expanse of the plaza and how the setbacks and cantilevers support this place and how planting um, and the seating will, will be support events and everyday function in the space. Next slide. Flipping from the opposite direction, the third looks east along Fulton Street, highlighting the planting and seating, which will support the everyday use of this plaza. Next slide. And because office space is critical for the proposal, it'll highlight the view from the new office space in the Brooklyn building that will support the incubation development of, of businesses. Um, and next slide. We'll pass along to Hillary Estrat uh, to next to discuss the proposed zoning actions. Thanks, Jacob. My name is Hillary Estrat Hamburg of Venable LLP Land Use Council to the applicant. I will briefly explain the proposed zoning actions. Next slide, please. We are requesting a zoning map amendment to change the project area zoning district from C45D to C62, a zoning text amendment to modify Appendix F of the zoning resolution to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area. While housing is not currently planned, this amendment would ensure a portion of any future housing would be affordable. We are also requesting a zoning text amendment to allow a reduction of loading berths within C62 zoning districts mapped in Brooklyn Community District 3 and the authorization of a large scale general development with special permits to waive height and setback regulations and the number of loading berths. Next slide, please. Now, Jacob explained some key differences between the C45D zoning district and C62 zoning district earlier in the presentation, such as expanded use groups and floor area. Here, we focus on how the large scale general development would impact the project. As indicated in the bottom row of this chart, the special permit would limit the building height, which in turn would also limit the amount of floor area that could be constructed. Next slide, please. Without a special permit, each building would be limited to a maximum street wall height of 85 feet or six stories then require a setback distance of 20 feet along narrow streets and 15 feet along wide streets before rising in accordance with the sky exposure plane. With the special permit, the Brooklyn building shown on section one in the upper left corner of the slide and section two on the bottom of the slide would have a maximum building envelope height of approximately 195 feet. The building would extend into the sky exposure plane along Brooklyn Avenue, Herkimer Street, and Fulton Street. There would also be a reduced setback along Fulton Street and Herkimer Street. The New York building, shown on the upper right corner of the slide, would have a maximum building envelope height of approximately 235 feet. The maximum building envelope would have a reduced setback and extend into the sky exposure plane on New York Avenue, Herkimer Street, and Fulton Street. Next slide, please. I will now turn it over to Jason Diaz of Philip Habib and Associates, who will provide a brief overview of the city environmental quality review process and the draft scope of work. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Diaz, and I'm with Philip Habib and Associates, who are serving as the environmental consultants for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation application. And I'll, be, and I'll spend the remainder of the presentation giving an overview of the draft scope of work, which provides a framework for how the draft environmental impact statement will be prepared. Next slide, please. The draft environmental impact statement, also referred to as the DEIS, will be consistent with the gui guidance of the latest version of the City Environmental Quality Review Technical Manual, also referred to as the Seeker Technical Manual. The Seeker Technical Manual is the standard guidance document for environmental analysis and review in the city of New York. Um, Seeker is a disclosure process by which decision makers evaluate the potential environmental consequences before approving a discretionary action. Seeker compares the future no action condition to the future with action condition 
through reasonable worst case development scenario, otherwise known as the RWCDS. The EIS will analyze the incremental changes that would reasonably be expected to occur if the proposed action is adopted. Public comments will be incorporated into a final scope of work, then a DEIS will be prepared in accordance with the final scope of work, which will then be published for public review and comment. Once published, a public hearing will be held in the draft EIS in which all the comments received during the hearing will be incorporated into the final environmental impact statement or FEIS. Next slide, please. As detailed in the draft scope of work, a reasonable worst case development scenario was established for the 2032 analysis year. In the no action condition, it is anticipated that the on site conditions would remain unchanged from existing conditions. In the with action condition, it is assumed the Bedford Stabs and Restoration Corporation campus will be redeveloped with three new mixed use buildings containing a combined total of approximately 600,000 square feet of commercial office space, 190,000 square feet of commercial retail space, 75,000 square feet of light industrial use group 11 space, and 125,000 square feet of community facility space, as well as approximately 140 accessory parking spaces and a minimum of approximately 31,000 square feet of public, publicly accessible private open space. Of the three proposed buildings include the New York building, the Brooklyn building, and the cultural building. The New York building would consist of a 16-story predominantly commercial building containing office, retail, light industrial, and educational space, and would be located at the westerly end of the project area. The Brooklyn building would consist of a 13-story predominantly commercial building containing office, retail, and light industrial space, and would be located at the easterly end of the campus. The cultural building would consist of a four-story predominantly uh, community facility building containing educational, cultural, and community center space and would be located mid block between the New York and Brooklyn buildings. Each of the proposed buildings would be connected by a minimum of approximately 31,000 square feet of at grade publicly accessible private open space. Next slide, please. Additionally, while the applicant does not intend to develop any residential uses as part of the proposed development, the proposed actions would increase the maximum permitted residential FAR to 7.2 and thus in accordance with seeker analysis framework, a second reasonable worst case development scenario known as the MIH scenario, will be assessed as part of the EIS. Similar to the proposed development, three new mixed use buildings would be analyzed under the MIH scenario. However, compared to the proposed development, the three MIH scenario buildings would contain less office and light industrial space and would contain approximately 200,000 square feet of residential space, which can accommodate up to 245 dwelling units. For seeker analysis purposes, all dwelling units under the MA, MIH scenario are assumed to be set at or below 130% of area media, median income, or AMI, due to an existing restrictive declaration placed on the site in 2019 by Empire State Development, which limits residential uses to below market rate housing, not exceeding 130% of AMI. Next slide, please. The requested Large-scale general development special permits will require the submission of drawings to the, the City Planning Commission and that the development program and massing of the proposed development be within scope of the reasonable worst case development scenarios analyzed in the, in the environmental review. As such, the large-scale general development drawings will include what is known as the maximum permitted development envelope in which the proposed de development or MIH scenario could be developed. The illustrative rendering on this slide depicts the maximum bulk bulk envelope permitted by the uh, large scale general development special permit. As you can see, the maximum permitted development envelope is slightly larger than the space that would be occupied by the proposed development, which allows for limited design flexibility. As the maximum development envelope is slightly larger than the proposed development, the potential effects associated with the maximum development envelope will be considered during environmental review. While the RWCDS is established, uh, with the RWCDS is established, and using criteria outlined in the 2021 Seeker Technical Manual, the EIS will determine if significant adverse impacts would occur. Next slide, please. As shown in this table, when comparing the no action condition to the with action condition under the proposed development, the proposed actions are expected to result in the net addition of approximately 430,000 square feet of commercial office space, 150,000 square feet of retail space, 75,000 square feet of light industrial use group 11 space, and 78,000 square feet of community facility space, as well as a net reduction of approximately 27,000 square feet of manufacturing space, a quarter acre of 
publicly accessible private open space, and nine off-street accessory parking spaces. The incremental change in workers that would result from the proposed actions under the proposed development is the net addition of approximately 3,059 new workers within the project area compared to no action conditions. Next slide, please. Under the MIH scenario, the proposed actions are expected to result in the net addition of approximately 130,000 square feet of commercial office space, 150,000 square feet of retail space, 28,000 square feet of light industrial use group 11 space, 208,000 square feet of residential space, and 78,000 square feet of community facility space, as well as a net reduction of approximately 27,000 square feet of manufacturing space, quarter acre of, pub of publicly accessible private open space, and nine off-street accessory parking spaces. In terms of population, the MIH scenario could generate up to approximately 635 incremental residents and 1,800 incremental workers within the project area compared to no action conditions. The incremental differences between the no action and with action condition highlighted in each of these tables and presented in the draft scope of work document will serve as the basis of the impact analyses in the DEIS. Next slide, please. As detailed in the draft scope of work and shown on this slide, the proposed actions require consideration of 16 of the 19 impact categories outlined in the speaker technical manual, including land use zoning and public policy, socioeconomic conditions, community facilities and services, open space, shadows, historic and cultural resources, urban design and visual, visual resources, hazardous materials, water and sewer infrastructure, transportation, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, noise, public health, neighborhood character, and construction. The draft scope of work provides a detailed outline of how these technical areas will be examined. For each of the technical areas, it identifies study areas, types of data to be gathered, and how these data would be analyzed and potential impacts quantified when appropriate. For the guidance of the seeker technical manual, the proposed actions would not warrant analysis for natural resources, solid waste and sanitation, or energy. I'll now briefly discuss a few of the technical areas to be analyzed in the EIS. For example, as the proposed actions would introduce new workers to the area, an analysis of socioeconomic conditions will be provided. The workers introduced to the area by the proposed actions would also increase demand for use of publicly accessible open spaces, and therefore analysis of open space resources is also wanted. Proposed actions would result in an increase in the number of vehicular trips and increased ridership on mass transit facilities, would affect pedestrian movements in the area due to the increased number of workers to the area. Therefore, a detailed transportation analysis will be included in the EIS, which will analyze the changes to traffic, transit, pedestrians, street user safety, and parking conditions as a result of the proposed actions. Through the increase in the number of vehicular trips within the area, the EIS will study the project generated effects of noise and air quality as a result of mobile sources. In addition, both the noise and air quality analyses will study the effects of stationary sources as well. The air quality chapter will provide analysis of heating, cooling, and air conditioning systems, large and major sources, and industrial sources, whereas the noise chapter will provide a stationary play area noise source analysis to the location of the schoolyard and playground at the nearby PS093 William H. Prescott and Satellite East Middle School. Construction of the proposed development is, is expected to take place over a period of approximately eight years over two phases, and is therefore considered long-term pursuant to seeker technical, ma technical manual guidance. As such, the EIS will evaluate the duration and severity of the disrup disruption or inconvenience to nearby sensitive receptors. The construction analysis will provide a description of the proposed construction program and phasing, and will examine the potential long-term construction impacts of the proposed development on tra transportation systems, air quality, and noise. Next slide, please. In addition, the EIS will include a mitigation chapter, which, is, which describes mitigation measures to adjust any significant adverse impacts that are identified in the EIS. Where impacts cannot be mitigated, they will be identified as unavoidable adverse impacts. An alternatives chapter will also be included in the EIS to evaluate alternative development proposals that may reduce or eliminate any significant adverse impacts. The alternatives are usually defined when the full extent of the proposed actions impacts are determined. As of now, the EIS is expected to study a no action alternative, which assumes the project area would remain as under existing conditions, and a no significant adverse impacts alternative, which presents a scenario where all action generated impacts are either eliminated or avoided. 
Additional alternatives may be developed during the scoping process in coordination with the lead agency. A chapter summarizing all comments on the draft scope of work and EIS will be included as well. The draft scope of work can be viewed in its entirety online on TCP's website as seen on the bottom of the slide. Thank you for your time. This marks the end of the applicant's presentation on the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation project and overview of the seeker framework. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Stephanie at ERD. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, and to all of our presenters. We can go to the next slide. And next slide. We will now move on to part two of the meeting. At this time, we will receive testimony from elected officials, community board leaders, and those speaking on behalf of government agencies. Uh, when it's your turn to speak, your name will be called and you will be promoted to panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera if you wish. There will be a short period that it appears you're no longer in the meeting. Don't be alarmed as you will automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. If speakers experience technical issues that, that prevent you from sharing your testimony today, we'll pause and move on to the next speaker and allow you to troubleshoot in the background, and we will call your name at a later time during the meeting. Uh, if this happens, there are how-to guides available on the NYC Engage website for assistance. Um, you can also call the meeting um, shown at the at the following one of the numbers at the top of the screen here, 877-853-5247. And when prompted for a meeting ID, it's shown at the bottom of the screen, 618-237-7396. And when prompted for a password, dial one. All right, I'm checking with our um, folks in the background. Um, it does not appear that we have any speakers uh, in this group, so we will now proceed to part three of the public scoping meeting where members of the general public are invited to speak. And again, this three minute time tracker will begin when you start your testimony um, that will go through each of our speakers here. Um, after three minutes have passed, you'll be asked to conclude your remarks. And again, if you do experience technical issues, please visit the how to guides or dial the numbers referenced um, just now for assistance. And we will now move on to our public speakers. Our first speaker is Omawale St. Just. And please feel free to correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name. I will take a moment for you to be promoted to panelist. Hello, welcome. Hi, how you doing? You can hear me? Yes. And uh, I guess I am good to go. Yes. Um, I've uh, written down some uh, some points to speak on. If you don't mind that I you know that I read from it. Um, hello, guys. My name is Omawali St. Jess, and I'm the CEO of SJ Solutions Security and Protection Services. Uh, my company was founded in 2011 with the assistance uh, from the Restorations um, Business Center. With Restoration support, I was able to secure a line of credit of $150,000 from a factoring company. Um, this money was critical to establishing the financial foundation for my company, allowing me to bring on uh, new employees. Uh, Restoration also supported me as I wrote my MWBE application, which helped secure my certification. Uh, we are growing rapidly, and I'm proud to say that we have exceeded uh, 4 million in sales annually. Um, actually, last year we had about 7 million in sales. Um, and uh, we've employed, uh, over the past year, we've employed over 300 people um, all over the city. Uh, our clients have included, uh, you know, we've done security for presidents of other countries, councilmen, councilmen, actors, rappers, uh, CEOs, senators, um, and we are doing a lot of business with the city of New York. Um, when we were uh, hit with the, with the financial difficulties during COVID, uh, restoration helped us secure a paycheck protection loan of $225,000. This money was critical to uh, helping me keep my staff paid. Um, I am very thankful for all the support and mentorship I've received um, through uh, Restoration. They have always been there whenever I needed them. Uh, expanding Restoration's campus would allow far more residents to take advantage of the resources like the Restoration Business Center 
to grow their own to to grow their economic power and and shrink their racial wealth gap. Um, we should be supporting more black business ownership in in Brooklyn. Uh, Innovation Campus will create so many new opportunities for residents at the heart of our neighborhood. This is going to be a much needed boost for the community that will create new entrepreneurs such as myself. Brooklyn is changing so much and I've seen so many of my neighbors priced out the community. If we can get more support through opportunities like Innovation Campus, I am optimistic that many more of our neighbors uh, will be able to stay. I thank you for your time and I hope you will uh, join me in supporting this important project. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, if you would like to send us uh, your written testimony, you can also do that to the uh, email address on um, that was shown at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, cool. Thanks for being here and uh, congratulations on your business success. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be Lorraine West to be followed by Yamisi Onayemi. So Lorraine West will promote you and we'll just take a moment. You should be able to unmute and turn on your camera if you wish. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, hello, my name is Lorraine West. I'm a wife, a mother, artist, and owner and designer of Lorraine West Jewelry. My pieces are inspired by my love and passion for connecting with people on an intuitive and authentic level. They're designed to reflect your own inner beauty and power. I launched my company with the support of Restorations Business Center in 2014, which financially empowers entrepreneurs and creatives like myself in Central Brooklyn. For nearly 10 years, Restoration has been a guiding force and a partner offering a judgment-free zone for me to express my ideas and receive constructive feedback for my brand. With restoration support, my business revenue has increased by 30% annually, and I've been able to grow my skills in sales and marketing. In 2021, we broke 100K in revenue for the first time, and I'm so excited to see my business continually grow with their support. Restoration and its services, like the Restoration Business Center, are some of the most important resources available to residents of Central Brooklyn. Everyone I know in the community has benefited from restoration, whether it's through their direct services or events on the plaza. Restoration is one of the champions of Bedford-Stuyvesant. Services like the Restoration Business Center help close the racial wealth gap, helping level the playing field for entrepreneurs like myself. My business and my jewelry are my passion, and I'm so thankful for Restoration's partnership and encouragement. The expansion of Restoration's campus will help even more people access Restoration services. I'm so excited about all the new companies and brands that want to invest in our neighborhood the right way, making sure longtime residents can benefit and access jobs. Bed-Stuy deserves a project like Innovation Campus. We deserve world-class spaces designed and led by the community. I hope you will move forward with Restoration's historic plans for Innovation Campus. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for being here. It's great to hear your story. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Yamisi Onayami to be followed by Aziza Pope. Yamisi Onayami, we will promote you to panelist and give you the opportunity to unmute. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Yes, hi. My name is Yemisi Anayemi, and I am I currently live in Brooklyn. I'm originally from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I joined rest, um, actually Restoration Plaza as an employee, um, business data analyst in 2020. And um, I was honestly inspired by the amount of work that we're doing, right? In the summer, like providing air conditioners, helping people get their credit score. And I when, when people, I was one of the, um participants right of like trying to improve the credit score and then later on uh when the leadership recognized my passion for technology I had the great opportunity of being a fellow at the restoration um Marcella partnership through the breakthrough fellowship program 
Um, the Breakthrough Fellowship Program was a 12-week pilot program design, designed to help individuals with prior programming and computer science experience access competitive and full-time software engineering roles. I was working towards a degree in city tech, but the curriculum wasn't strong enough, right? Um, and the program helped me, you know, to learn more about technical interviews. It provided me with financial support, emotional support through the program stipend that helped me while I was in the program. Eventually, I landed a job with JP Morgan Chase, where I'm making like my first six figure salary um, and with the opportunity to even make more clearly. But even beyond the money, it's the skills and further like the emotional support that I still get while I'm still a part, um, while I'm still still um, connected to restoration, financial counseling, you know, investment counseling, still getting help with my credit score. Um, I think the Restoration Innovation Campus is really an exciting program, an opportunity, um, exciting opportunity rather for the community. And there's so many people like me who could benefit from Restoration's program, especially training for high quality tech jobs. Um, it's very important for us to create wealth and, you know, to close the wealth gap in um, our community um, and in our community for black and brown folks. And the most important way we can do that, right, is by establishing and providing skills at the core that, you know, people can build wealth on, right? Um, and with this opportunity, I think restoration is like going to... To, to, to like effectively be able to do that. Um, our community should be empowered to have the same resources as wealthier neighborhoods. We deserve to be given the opportunity to succeed. We deserve the opportunity to build wealth for ourselves and for our families. The Restoration Innovation Campus will make it, definitely make it more common to see people like myself in the workforce. I kid you not when I tell you, I sit in meetings and I'm like, I'm the only woman or I'm the only black girl. And I'm like, it's 2023. You would think this program, there are a lot of them, right? Unfortunately, it's still not a lot of people. Um, and I need to see more people like myself. I need to have mentors. I want to be able to see in four or five years that I'm mentoring girls of color, Black girls, Black boys in the tech industry as engineers, as product managers, as like financial analysts, um, right? Your time uh, is up if you can conclude your remarks. Thank you for your time. And I urge you to support Restoration's ambitious plans to disrupt the racial wall gap in Innovation Campus. Thank you so much. And if you have more to submit, uh, we do welcome that written testimony if you'd like to submit that as well. Thank you so much for being here and for, for sharing your story with us. Um, our next speaker will be Aziza Pope to be followed by Ruben Colon. Aziza, we will be uh, promoting you to panelist in just one moment and you will be able to provide your testimony. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. So my name is Aziza. Um, restoration has always been a major part of my life from as far as I can remember. I started dancing with Restoration when I was three years old and I stayed into the program all the way until I was 18 when I graduated high school. And for me, Restoration was more than just like an after school program or just like an activity to do over the weekends. Um, because it was a family oriented community that prepared us as students for life, regardless of if we wanted to go into dance or not. Um, the skills that I learned with the Youth Box Academy, um, I still use them today, such as discipline and how to balance life with school and, you know, everything that's going on. Um, Restoration also provided many opportunities programs and events that were that were not accessible to us um, in public schools. And the sense of community and family that I gained at Restoration um, is what keeps me coming back and always willing to serve. Like just last week when I was helping out, um, they did a Black Lives Matter art gala exhibit. I was able to meet someone who was from Morocco who only been in the United States for two weeks. And I feel like something like that is something that can only happen at Restoration. Like um, it's very big on culture and very accepting and opening, opening and welcoming to many people. Um, and also the plans for innovation campus are so exciting. And as a product of restoration culture programming, I cannot wait to see the expansion and the impact that it will have on my community that I grew up in and the student, students who are also just like me. Um, the artistic and cultural expression is also so important in a community like Bedside. So I'm excited to see the expansion. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. All right. Our next speaker is Ruben Colon. And if you haven't yet registered to speak but wish to, uh, again, please visit the NYC Engage portal uh, where you will see this meeting and the opportunity to register. Uh, Ruben Colon, welcome. Yes, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for, for uh, allowing me to address uh, the panel and the board. Uh, my name is Ruben Colon. Uh, I'm an area standards rep for the Carpenters Union in, in Brooklyn. Uh, I am a former member of my community board for over six years, uh, and I am a union carpenter for 28 years. I'm also a, a, a Brooklyn resident for 55 years of my life. Uh, I also represent over 275 carpenters and their families who live in the immediate area of the project. Uh, uh, the little I know of uh, Bedford Restoration Corp uh, is good. I think uh, that such a project would be beneficial for the community, as well as the members uh, that I have living in the area. Uh, I caution uh, those sitting on the panel uh, to consider that uh, oftentimes we refer to construction jobs as temporary jobs. Uh, my entire career has been based upon a series of temporary jobs. The average New Yorker uh, has a stay at, a, at any particular job between three and four years. So technically all jobs are temporary. Uh, the difference with me here and, and, and union jobs is that they come with benefits. Uh, they come with medical benefits, pension benefits, and, and so on. Uh, safety standards uh, equal to none out there. We have a series of predatory contractors in our communities preying upon people of color. I, I, I would suggest that labor standards be considered uh, for this project, if, if not prevailing wage, at the very least uh, consider uh, the use of reputable contractors that employ people uh, like my 275 members that live in the area. Uh, I think that this is a great project. I think it's much needed in the community. Uh, I look forward to reaching out uh, to Bedford uh, Stuyvesant Restoration Corp. I'm surprised our paths haven't crossed just yet, uh, but here we are. Uh, I, I look forward to working with them and, and coming up with a plan if indeed uh, they get permission to move forward uh, with the scope of the project, uh, to work with them uh, from on everything from community hire to bringing good union jobs to the community. Uh, I think this is a, a great plan so far. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, it does not appear that we have any um, folks who have joined us by telephone, so I will skip those instructions. Um, and now I will ask if there is anyone else who wishes to speak at this time. Uh, we have come to the end of our list of registered speakers. Um, so if you have not yet registered to speak and wish to do so and are joining online, um, we'll give you an opportunity to please uh, register online now. Again, the instructions are on the NYC Engage portal, uh, which is listed here. Um, and uh, phone numbers and passwords for assistance are shown on the screen here if you have any issues. Um, we will now take about a five minute break to let anyone who um, has not yet registered to speak and wish to do so the opportunity. Um, so we will um, wait about five minutes. So we'll reconvene around three o'clock uh, to see if we have any additional registered speakers.
Good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, you are tuning in to the remote public scoping meeting for the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation proposal. Again, for the record, the proposal seeker number is 23DCP076K. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Shalou. I'm the director of the New York City Department of City Planning's Environmental Assessment Division, or EARD. We're currently on part three of our public scoping meeting where members of the general public are invited to speak for up to three minutes providing testimony. Um, and we uh, took a break to see if anyone else who uh, was interested in speaking had registered to speak. Um, we did not receive any additional registrants. Um, so we have heard from everyone who wishes to speak today. Um, so we will now move to close the meeting. So if anyone was not able to join or provide testimony today, uh, please recall that you are able to submit written testimony online um, on the NYC Engage portal on the um, meetings page or through DCP's website or by emailing or mailing your comments to the Department of City Planning at the email or mailing address shown on the screen now. Again, the deadline for submitting written comments is 5 p.m. on Monday, February 27th, 2023, and we give those written comments the same attention as we do to the comments that were provided here today at this meeting. With that, we will close the meeting. It is 3.02 p.m. and the public scoping meeting is now closed. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great afternoon.